Um, I, I, I'm never quite sure when we can get everything set up for it. I mean, I was aware for this for a little while, but you know, I didn't have anything finalized. But over spring break, we got it finalized. And that is an opportunity for a service learning project. Um, the notion of service learning is that um, you know, students can learn by working on projects that benefit um, worthy organizations uh, in the area. Um, so for example, you know, nursing students might go to a shopping center and take blood pressures, for example. You know, they're learning how to do blood pressures or they're practicing that skill. And uh, you know, the benefit of the community is you know, they, people get their blood pressure checked. Um, it's a little harder to do that with, you know, with uh, web development, you know. So therefore, our, the way ours works is a little different. And, and first of all, this is not a requirement. This is an option, uh, an optional project. So for your project, you can either continue doing what you have been doing and continue working on a project of your own choosing, all right? and develop the design document, and develop the final website, and there you go. If you have not done anything on your project yet, or if you haven't done a lot on your project yet, you might want to consider doing the website for a nonprofit organization um, that um, is a resource for, for people with cancer and their, their families. Um, now, the rules for the project are still the same. It's an individual project. You will work on it and do it. All right. Um, you will follow the design document that I've specified. Um, you will create a finished project. You'll do everything as though you, know, you were doing, taking the other option, except instead of you making up the topic, the topic has been made up for you. Now, there's a few good, clear advantages to that. All right. The first good, clear advantage is that if you're having a hard time thinking of a topic, and if you're having a hard time thinking of what you want to put on your on your site for for your project, um, so you know by doing it for a nonprofit organization, they'll give you some really good ideas of what they want, right? So some of that work is taken off your hands. Now you still need to document it, and you still need to create your design document and all that. But if you're really sitting scratching your head, like, hmm, I have no idea what to do and what should I put on this page, they'll give you some ideas. All right, so that's the first benefit. The second benefit is what I typically do uh, with this, is I show at the, at the end of the term, when everyone's turned it in, I, I, I um, turn in a, uh, I, I let them take a look at everyone that's turned in a project for them, and they pick the one that they, that they want to use, and then that, that website will actually go live. All right. So it's a win-win situation. They get a website, and the advantage of that is instead of just you creating a project that you know for something that you're interested in or you know that that you find fun, you're actually creating a website that you can go and put on your resume and say, "I developed this website." All right, um, and and that's a big boost. You know, um, employers above everything else want to know that you can do the job, right? That's the bottom line. You know, different employers have different requirements and you know, years experience or, or educational level. And that varies from employer to employer. But really, the question they're trying to answer is, can you do the job? Well, one way to demonstrate you can do the job is to actually do the job. Well, how do you get a chance to do the job if you don't have experience? You know, this is a vicious circle. Well, one way is an opportunity such as this. You know, you can say, hey, in addition to all this education, I actually created a, a website and it's live and here it is. You want to talk to the people I did it for? Boom, here they are. You want to talk to my instructor? Boom, here he is. And it's, it's a good way uh, uh, to, to do that. Um, now, as far as that goes, this Thursday, we're going to have representatives from the organization here, all right? And they're going to speak to the class, so that will take up some of the lecture time. Now, regardless of whether you are interested in pursuing this project or not, it would be valuable for you to be there for this because, all right, it will help you through the process of understanding 
just exactly how you work with the user and discuss requirements with the user and come to a conclusion as far as what they actually need for the site. All right? Now, users run the extreme from knowing exactly what they want to not having a clue what they want, but they just know they need a website. And that's understandable, right? I mean, their, 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 their expertise is not in web development, right? So, you know, sometimes developers take sort of a, uh, uh, a view about users, oh, they don't know what they want. Well, yeah, it's not their job. Of course they don't know what they want, all right? Now, there's some users that are very sophisticated that do know exactly what they want. They can tell you exactly what they want. Regardless of, now I have no idea, these, these folks, uh, you know, I met them, they, they, they seemed, uh, you know, very intelligent, very nice, and, and all that. Um, I, I'm not sure, I mean, I, I do know they have at least some idea of what they want. Um, they'll, they'll give you more details on that on Thursday. But, you know the questions that you need them to answer for you, right? How do you know the, the, those questions? Because those are the questions that are in the design, design documents. What are your goals? What are the goals of this site? What are the goals that you as an organization have for this site? What are, uh, who are some of the types of users that are going to be visiting your site? What are some of the things that we can do to help you achieve these goals? And so on. So you know you have to prepare the design document so you know the questions that you need answered. So when they, when they speak on Thursday, they're likely not to go down and start at the top and say, my organization's three goals are this. These are the goals of my users. My personas are this, that, and the other. You know, they, they haven't seen the design document before. They're not going to go and follow through that procedure and, and, and run down the line. It's your job to get that information out of them. Now, that may require you to sort of read between the lines. You know, they may not say, one of my personas is... But they might say, you know, we're going to have people that uh, are visiting the site that have just been diagnosed with cancer. And, and the one point that they raised uh, when I met with them over break is they raised that they also want to be a resource to, to families of people that have cancer. For example, you know, if your spouse or, or a member of your family uh, has cancer, that puts a strain on you, too, you know, and, and as far as getting things done around the house and needing assistance with this, that, or the other. You know, there's a lot of different resources that, that can be available. And so it's not just the people that have it, it's, it's the, the family surrounding them as all. So that would be maybe another persona that they will have. The point is, is you have to get this out of, of, uh, out of the user one way or the other. Uh, or I should say the client as opposed to the user. So, um, you might have to re read between the lines and you might have to ask questions. So, I want you all to come in, whether or not you're going to take this option on the project or not, I want you to come in and, and act as though you are going to, to, to do this and, and listen and ask the questions and try to get the answers to the questions that you would need were you doing the design for this. All right. Um, I imagine that they will also give us some documents that I'll post electronically to the, uh, to, to the ANGEL site. Um, as you're working on this, you may have questions. Uh, we'll play it by ear. I would ask at least initially that you run the questions past me first, just on the, on the chance that I know the answer to the question, I can give it to you uh, without having them bombarded with, with a bunch of questions. And for the people that are taking this class online, you're also welcome to participate in this. And again, while you won't have the opportunity to ask questions, you will have the opportunity to see the speaker um, uh, on Thursday. Um, I, I guess you will have the opportunity to ask questions, just, just not in person. You'll have to email those in. All right. So, to summarize, Thursday we're going to have a, uh, some visitors from a nonprofit organization, and they, uh, their project is an option that you can take as far as your semester project. You can develop a website for this organization. And uh, again, the, the advantages to it is that they will do, I, I hesitate to say they'll do some of the work for you, but uh, because they won't. Um, they, uh, they will supply you with a lot of the information that you need to do the work that you need to. That's maybe a better way to put it. And in addition, if your site does go live, if they choose your site to go live, this is a great thing to add to the resume. Let me bring up 
what last semester, not last semester, last spring semester, a student in this class did um, for uh, a, a Lorraine organization. This student actually still works with this organization, not like as an employee, but still volunteers to, to update their site, even though she no longer lives in state. All right. Here's the website that they did. I do apologize. I'm, I, I wrestled with the screen for 15 minutes before class, all right, and it, it, it didn't work very well. But this is the site, the Samuel L. Felton Jr. Community Development Program. And as you can see, a person who really did a good job on this. Yeah, you, you can't see, it's kind of cut off. Let me try moving it down. There you go. Here's the navigation on the top, there's the banner, there's that, and then the content area is down there. Yeah, I mean, really did a good job. Now I know, again, I, I've seen the work that you folks have done, and, and, and you folks are really doing a great job, and you're coming along good, and, and this will be a really good opportunity for you. The one thing to keep in mind, you know, and, and, I, and I tell organizations this when, when I, I speak with them, is that, you know, uh, and I'll tell you this, because sometimes students think, oh, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm ready to do a, a site, uh, you know, a live site. Well, you know, the thing is, is if an organization doesn't have any website, how can what you make be worse than that? All right? <laughs> probably not. There's probably no way that you can make a site that is worse than having no site. There might be a way. I don't know. But you kind of have to try. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, you, you really have to try to do that. So, therefore, I encourage you to take part in it. If you're not interested in participating in this as your project, if you want to continue working on what you had planned on doing, maybe you've already started it, maybe over spring break you got it all wrapped up and you're just waiting to turn it in, you know, I can always dream, right? Um, that's okay. I would ask you, though, to participate Thursday as though you were doing the project because that in itself is a good exercise, talking with users and so on because, you know, the assignments, I will say, gee, I want a page that has three links and, and has information about this topic and that topic. You know, users don't, or clients don't give you the information that flat out. You sometimes have to do a little work to get to it. So that would be a good exercise. All right, any questions about this? Great. Let's go on to our next topic, uh, which is a topic that I think many web developers don't know tons about. All right, and that is a topic of accessibility. All right. Um, many web developers, if you ask them about accessibility, they will say something like, our site is accessible, you know, I use the alt attribute on all my images, thinking that that is all they need to do to make their site accessible. I've, I've actually had web developers pretty much tell me that more than once. And it's kind of sad. And even your textbook really doesn't go into it uh, in as much depth as I'd like to. So I kind of have some materials out on the web that you can look at uh, and see and get that. Let, let me pull those up real quick. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation that you can read. Uh, I won't go through it because I hate giving PowerPoint presentations. But you can read it. Um, If, if, if I'm ever going to lecture about a topic, you know, in this class or another class that you're not interested in and you don't want to talk about it that day, just at the beginning of class ask me why I don't like PowerPoint presentations. And I'm, I'm sure we will not talk about the, that topic the rest of the period. But I did create a PowerPoint presentation for a little seminar we had with faculty members here about accessibility. And there's really a separate folder even for these accessibility resources. I passed it? Yeah, here we go. 
accessibility resources. Here's a PowerPoint that I would have given if I gave PowerPoint presentations. All right. And then there's a number of other resources here. And some of these resources will be more relevant later on. For example, accessible forms. Well, we haven't talked about forms yet, so that's kind of a moot point. But keep that in the back of your mind uh, for later. So do read through these. You know, Definitely read through this accessibility resource PowerPoint presentation and look through some of the other resources. Now, you already should be somewhat familiar with accessibility because we had, I believe, a couple of assignments where you had to at least talk about it on some level. When I speak of, of accessibility for websites, what is it that I mean? How would you define accessibility? Yes. Okay. Right, right. The, the statement was, uh, the statement the student make, I'm going to paraphrase, is, is, is designing your site in such a way so that people um, that have certain disabilities such as including hearing, vision, uh, motor skills, you know, moving their hands, whatever, can access the site uh, and, and get information from it. Now again, you, you did make a good point. There's nothing that we can do to make the experience identical for such, such folks. If you, if you can't see, there's nothing we can do to make a video um, you know, completely accessible. But we can still provide that information in another format to people with those disabilities. All right? What I liked about the student's definition is that it talked about a variety of disabilities. All right. The first mistake that people make when they talk about accessibility or they think about accessibility is they think in terms solely in terms of like making the web available for people that are blind. All right. That obviously, given that the web is, is so visual, you know, and, and you're looking at some, the typical user looks at something on the screen. Um, that's that's the first and, and most obvious uh, disability that is relevant. Um, but it's certainly not the only disability. All right. A second case in point is there are people who suffer from severe disabilities. There are other people that may not have that precise disability, but have some of the same obstacles at least to some degree. All right. What do I mean by that? All right. What I mean by that is for example, let's, let's, talk about, let's not talk about websites for a second. Let's talk about just accessibility within a building. All right? There are people who are paralyzed or confined to wheelchairs. All right? they, they can't use their legs. And, uh, so what are some things that we can do in our buildings to make it easier for them? Yes? Uh, we have buttons that you can press to open doors. Okay, automatic doors. Elevators or ramps? Elevators, ramps. All right? Now, is there another group of people that could benefit from those that aren't in wheelchairs, but could benefit maybe for some of those things? People on crutches. So they're not paralyzed, they're not permanently injured, all right, but they have some temporary injury, you know. Another group of people. Elderly. Pardon me? Elderly. Elderly, all right. Another group. See, we're getting that. You had to repeat elderly twice for me to hear it. So that kind of gives, uh, uh, gives a hit of where we're headed here uh, for that. What about a mom or dad pushing a baby stroller? All right. What about someone that is, um, they just went by a second ago, pushing a cart All right. of equipment? Someone that has their handful of books, taking it to, you know. There's a lot of people that, that, again, they don't necessarily have the disability per se, but maybe they have it uh, a milder case of it. All right? Um, so, let's start out with people that are blind. All right? People that are blind, yeah, obviously blindness is a big disability. But there are people who have other vision problems that you wouldn't classify them as blind. But yet they have some problems seeing. And for example, extreme nearsightedness, all right? Uh, color blindness, um, and so on. 
So again, one myth about accessibility is people will say, and people will tell you, that's, you know, it's an awful lot of expense to go to for just a small percentage of the population, thinking that you're only talking about people that are completely 100% blind. What I'm pointing out to you here is that the scope of accessibility extends beyond people that are blind in a couple different directions. First of all, it's not just people that are totally blind that can have vision-related problems accessing the web. I have a hard time reading some sites where the font is, is very small. Right, yes? Uh, yeah, it doesn't really, uh, when we talk about accessibility, we're really focusing on um, um, people with, with different uh, disabilities. Um, as far as languages go, like, you know, like making a site multilingual, I, I guess that is, that is probably part of a bigger group of, of just general usability, all right? Um, you know, accessibility really is focused on the, the access for people with disabilities, but accessibility really is part of a bigger uh, uh, pie, so to speak, of usability. And I guess I would include multilingual as another part there too. I would include cross-browser compatibility in, in there as well. The idea is, is you've made a great site. I want everyone in the world to be able to see that site, or, or if not see it, be able to interact with it. See it's probably a bad choice of words. All right, um, but again, so yeah, that would that, that's sort of a related topic, but it's not really part of accessibility. All right, so we talked about vision, and so the first thing is that in addition to these people that have a, a severe form of the disability, there's also people with milder forms of, of a related disability that are affected as well, and in addition, there's other uh, disabilities beyond vision. Uh, what are some of the other disabilities beyond vision? Yes? Uh, loss of limb. Loss of limb. All right. That's obviously a very severe uh, disability. If someone doesn't have a hand, for example, or, or whatever, it's going to be difficult to navigate uh, with the mouse. Um, what, are maybe, what is uh, maybe a less severe uh, example of that sort of disability? Yeah, arthritis, carpal tunnel, all right, yes. Yeah, oh, something of, of temporary injury where their hand is broken temporarily. Okay, yeah. So again, you know, you can talk about a severe form of paralysis or loss of limb as one thing, but then you can see that there's, even for that one, there's sort of milder forms of it that also will have a big impact, you know. No, the person isn't paralyzed, but if they have carpal tunnel, it's very difficult to navigate around. All right. Uh, yes, they have their hand, but it's in a cast because it's broken. All right. Another disability. Cognitive and neurological. Cognitive and neurological. Uh, can you give some specific examples of those? Uh, like ADHD. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, ADHD at uh, what was that attention deficit? Uh, what's the HD? Hyperactive. Okay. Yeah. So attention deficit. Uh, other examples of this neurological or cognitive disabilities. ADHD would be a big one. Yeah, like if you have dyslexia. Go ahead. Dyslexia. dyslexia. All right. What? what? <laughs> Epileptic. All right, that, that's another case. Now, this is a great one to, to examine in more detail because uh, I want to come, come to a, a conclusion uh, shortly here uh, about this. ADHD, epilepsy, dyslexia. Let's think of those disabilities. Um, people with epilepsy are, are prone to having seizures. All right, people with ADHD, to give a very simplified uh, uh, description of it, can have trouble focusing all right, on, on a particular task and staying on task. People with dyslexia, um, it, it's not like some people think where the letters and words are reversed. Uh, there's all different, you know, dyslexia is a very individualistic thing. 
And again, people simply have a hard time recognizing some letters or confuse a couple letters or whatever. What do you think we can do on a web page to help people like this, that, uh, of those three conditions? What are some of the things we could do? Well, for the dyslexia, we can kind of improve spacing. Yeah, with the dyslexia, we can have good spacing of the letters. We can choose a good font, all right, a very readable sort of font. We can make sure it's an appropriate size. We can make sure that, the, that it contrasts well with the background. We can do all those things. Anything else we can do? For dyslexia, yes. Okay. Yeah, use images along with the text. All right. So if you're talking about a topic, the image can help that person, you know, focus and, and, and get a sense of the topic, and that may help them interpret words that they're having trouble reading. Okay. What about people with epilepsy? What would be the big thing there? And you mentioned that. Yeah, don't use uh, uh, flashing, blinking stuff, all right, uh, on your pages. So, so certain animations uh, and and that sort of thing. So that would be that would be one thing for them. Um, what about people with ADHD? What's something that we can do on our web pages to help those people focus on the stuff? Yes. Yeah, maybe create compelling content. You, you mentioned create some kind of game. That, that's a very good, very specific answer. But make your content compelling or interesting so people are, are, are following it. Interactive, kind of like the game, but... Interactive, perhaps. What else? Yes. Uh, keep most of the colors kind of, not really bland, but not overly crazy bright. Yeah, don't go with an overkill with colors. Uh, I have a really bad headache today, so I won't bring it up, but you folks remember the bridal site that we saw earlier in the term, yeah. you know. Um, so keeping your design, I won't say bland, I'll say the nicer word for it, uh, of simple, you know. Simple is, is good in web design very often. Um, anything else that you can think of besides those things? Just in general have a lack of clutter. All right, have nice spacing between things and all that. Now, that's what we're going to do for those people with disabilities. All right, let's look at it from the perspective of the person that does not have any of those disabilities at all. How many people that don't have those disabilities do you think enjoy gratuitous animations that are in their face and blink all the time? How many of you like those? All right. No, <laughs> not too many people like those. How many people like fonts that are hard to read? How many people like fonts where the, where the color doesn't contrast a, 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 a well with the background? How many people like when the page is cluttered? How many people like where the page uses 50 million colors, and like, the, like that bridal page that we're not going to show until my headache is gone? <laughs> All right. The point is, is that an interesting fact is, is that it's not a matter of developing a accessible website. It's not just a matter of accessible website because many of the things we do for accessibility benefit people that are also not disabled. All right, and don't have that disability. For example, um, the the bit of having an image on the page. We might do that in part to help convey our information to people that are dyslexic. They see that image, they're able then maybe to put the words in a better context and maybe help them understand it better. Well, guess what? I like looking at web pages that have words and pictures on them as well instead of just a giant block of text. All right? I don't want my page to be colored, you know, crazy with the colors. I want it to be a very simple color theme. Um, I don't want my page to be crowded. I want adequate space between all that. So a lot of these things, they benefit people with disabilities, but you know what? They're also general good web design principles. That brings up a, a sort of a bigger topic than accessibility, and that's the notion of universal usability. All right? 
Universal usability, the notion of this is we're not developing a website for people with handicaps or with disabilities. We're developing websites that are going to be effective for everyone to use. The things that we're going to do are going to be good both for people that have those disabilities or for people that don't, at least some of the time. Let me give you a for instance, all right, um, with, the, uh, with, with some of the physical things here. All right. We already mentioned automatic doors. That certainly benefits people with disabilities, but we note, noted a number of other cases where it benefits people, at least some of the time. All right. Someone pushing a baby stroller. All right. um, someone pushing a cart of things. We talked about an elevator. Yeah, that benefits someone that's in a wheelchair, but it also benefits someone that you know, pull the muscle in their leg and they don't feel like going up steps on that particular day because it hurts too much. All right. So that's sort of the idea here. We're developing content and we're presenting it in such a way so that people with disabilities, people without disabilities are, are going to benefit uh, from it. All right. There's two ways that disabilities uh, can be um, how do I want to say, uh, I don't want to say defeated, uh, can be accommodated for. One of them is through the use of what's called assistive technologies. In the physical world, a wheelchair would be an example of an assistive technology. It's something that helps a person, something extra that a person has that helps them do something, a, a piece of equipment. What are some examples of assistive technologies in the, 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 the digital world in, in online. Yes. Magnifier. Magnifier. Right. Um, building the windows, and again, we have an ancient version of windows here, but it's probably still here. I do not see that. But yeah, they're, they're in some versions of Windows, there's a magnifier where you can go and you can put that over, the, over a portion of the screen and see it. What's another example of assistive technology? Speech, uh, speech conversion. Right, speech conversion. And that can go either way, right? Someone asked, you know, people with, you know, someone mentioned as a disability, people without hands. And I was like, wow, that's a tough one. You know, what do you do for that? Well, through speech recognition, you can possibly uh, uh, assist those people. Goes the other way too. People that can't see the screen, there are narration programs that would go and read the page to them. So using speech. Uh, other examples of assistive technologies. Braille tablets. Braille tablets. Yeah, the, the take the screen display and turn it uh, into braille. All right. Now you might think to yourself, to Access the web page by having the narrator read it to you would not be very fun at all. All right, and I don't think we have the narrator here. You might want to play around with it on, on newer versions, Windows 7. There's there's a screen reader, a narrator. And you might think, gee, that's very difficult and it's very tedious and all that. Well, yeah, but if that's the only way you can access a computer and the web, that's your only choice, right? So it does, you know, people that can't see do amazing things, uh, things that seem amazing to us because we don't, we're, fortunately for us, we don't have to, to, to take those extraordinary measures, all right? But if you have to do it, you do it, all right? Um, and I think I mentioned this. Um, uh, a few years ago, I, when I worked uh, as uh, a faculty fellowship at NASA, my, my office mate was a high school student that was blind. She made her way around ca uh, the, the NASA campus, which is a giant place. Which it's easy for anyone to get lost. All right. Um, she navigated the, the web. She created PowerPoint presentations. She did many, you know, most if not all of the things that you would expect a person her age to be able to do on a computer including probably using IM software to chat with her friends when she should have been working. All right. Uh, now, 
from time to time she would call me over and say, what's on my screen? All right, and I'd have to, to help her out uh, where there was, was something where the page wasn't really designed very accessible or there was a, the, a hitch in that. But for the most part, she was able to interact uh, completely. And again, I apologize if I mentioned this before, uh, but um, it, it would be odd coming in uh, in the morning and go into the office when the office was dark, the lights were off, her screen was dark. She didn't bother turning it on, right? If you're not going to read it, save the electricity. And she would be sitting there at the keyboard typing away. I mean, that's an odd thing to see until you, until you get used to it. But again, it's amazing to do that. And I, I guess that's a testimony both to the resilience of people and, and the strength and the, the abilities that people can find when, when they have to. And it's also a, a statement of what can be done through the use of some assistive technology plus universal usability. All right. Now, she wouldn't be able to navigate even with the screen reader if people didn't take the time to make their websites accessible. All right. Assistive technology, a wheelchair. All right. Um, yeah, that helps people get around. But if there was no elevator in this building, the wheelchair wouldn't do the person any good getting up to the second floor. So what helps people with disabilities work their way through the world, whether it be a physical world or the virtual world, is a combination of the assistive technologies that they have plus the notion of universal uh, usability, designing things that are usable for uh, everyone. Yes? What kind of keyboard? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the question was, is the on-screen keyboard an example of that? And yes, it is. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that. I had a student that had a, a very severe neurological, uh, she was combined to a wheelchair, so she, she couldn't use her legs, and she had very limited usage of her arms. She could move her arms, but not, uh, not she couldn't make the very subtle movements that, that, you could, that, that would be required for typing or whatever. And she would use the on-screen keyboard. You know, she'd pull up the, the keyboard on screen and she'd be able to go. And instead of going in and typing the letters, you go and you click on the letter. Again, tedious, but if that's all you can do, it's good that you can at least do it that way. But yeah, that's another good example of, uh, of a piece of assistive technology. All right. Let's run through some of the disabilities and talk about what we can do to make our pages more accessible. All right, I think we hit most of the disabilities. All right, um, I, I, uh, I'm not sure if we mentioned hearing or not, uh, but hearing would be another disability that, that's affected. So we talked about neurological things, and we talked about some of the things that we could do for people that, that had those disabilities. And we also talked about how those accommodations that we do for people with those disabilities really makes good sense for everyone else as well, right? A good, clean, clear, simple design is good for everyone, all right? So you can say you're doing it for people with those disabilities or you can say you're doing it because it's just good design, doesn't matter. Either way, you're coming up with a site that is universally usable. What about people with hearing problems? What are some things that you can do for people with hearing problems? On your... yeah, closed, captions. closed captions on any video that you would have. All right. What, uh, if not closed captions, what else can you do? Transcriptions, right? Where you have a transcript of any audio, uh, audio text that uh, uh, audio that you have. So either closed caption or transcription probably would be the way to do it for uh, people with hearing problems. Now, keeping with the theme of universal usability, how can closed captions and transcripts help people who aren't necessarily deaf, but maybe have some other conditions or are in other circumstances? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Or, for example, over in our labs. We don't have speakers in the labs because it would, you know, it could be crazy, you know, if everyone was blaring their own favorite music uh, going on at the same time. All right, so because of that, in a lab situation, they have the speakers turn off. 
all right? And let's say you didn't bring headphones, all right? What are you going to do? You, want, you need to see this video. Well, you could look at the transcript or you could uh, lo look at the caption. What's another case of where it could benefit people? Yeah, some people, uh, 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 I guess the learning style, um, pe some people learn better from hearing, some people from looking, and, and maybe combining that, that, that would help that. Yes? It could help if you're new to the language, too. Yeah. If you're new to the language, sure. That would be, that'd be very good. Short-term memory? Short-term memory? That's almost, in a way, getting along with that, right, w with what that person said. In other words, it would be better to read it and hear it. That would reinforce it. And, yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. I I'll tell you, I go to CNN site a lot, and a lot of their reports, they have only video. And that burns me up. Why? Because I can read faster than watching a five-minute video, all right? If I see a headline that I think I'm interested in, all right, um, I may not know if I'm really interested in it, first of all, and I might just want to like get to the bottom line, all right, you know. Will that blizzard come and hit Ohio today, you know, <laughs> just tell me that. I don't care about the rest of it. I don't care what it did in Nebraska or, or whatever. I just want to get the bottom line, all right. And video is bad for that, all right. Video is harder to scan. Video is typically, you watch it from beginning to end. I, I suppose you can try to fast forward and do that, but that's, that's imprecise at best, all right? Whereas, if, if they had that video and, along with the transcript, I could go and I'm a fast reader. I could scan through, get the information I need like that, all right? The other case, again, would be, and, and uh, not necessarily someone that's deaf, but just has a hard time maybe hearing some things, you know? Um, especially if there's other noises going around, you know, and so on, that, that a caption like that can, can be useful, all right? So, again, yes? So, it's unlawful to not make sites inclusive, right? Oh, that's a good question. There are standards, they're not necessarily, the W3C isn't necessarily a legal uh, uh, um, entity. So, there is one, right? Well, there is, the well there is, there is the, the, the ADA, the American Disabilities Act, uh, back so many years ago and all that. It is, it is mandatory for any government site to be accessible, and for other sites, I'm not sure if it is, I don't believe it's necessarily strictly speaking against the law, but it's something that you could open yourself up to legal. So the government sites Government sites have to be accessible. Yeah, but the other ones, I, I am not sure if it is literally against the law or if it's something that you could simply sue for. All right. Um, I have to confess, I've talked to a lot of different people about this and I've gotten a different answer every single time. All right, and not being a lawyer, <laughs> it's hard to uh, it's hard to tell for sure uh, what that is. I will say, you know, uh, one of the links I don't know if you looked at real quick in my resources was about Target being sued for not having accessible uh, accessible website. So, um, oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Well, that's not inaccessible because it, 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 it penalizes everyone exactly the same way. So whether you're using a screen reader or that, you can't read it. Yeah. Um, I, I guess my view on it is this. You can take, you know, you can take the high road, all right, and say, I want my website, it, 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 it's good, it, it, it's... Uh, you know, it, it's ethical and it's good not to eliminate anyone from accessing my site. So, if I was developing a website, I would want to develop a website that was accessible to everyone simply because I wouldn't want to limit and deprive people of the content I have on my site. From a business's perspective, I want a, you know, at the risk of sounding crass, I want a blind person's money just as much as I want a person that can seize money, right? 
So therefore, there's that benefit. If you think of it, if you're a person that's blind, being able to shop online is probably great for you. You don't have to go and get a ride and, and all that there. You can do it right from the comfort of your own home. So from a business perspective, it is good. The legal side is fuzzy, but I know I have heard of organizations being sued for having an inaccessible site. So if it's not illegal, it does put you on dicey legal grounds. All right. Do we have another question or comment? I thought I saw a hand go up. Maybe. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> right. So we, we've seen an example of two disabilities um, where um, you, you, uh, the, the, the accommodations that you can take can benefit people that either have a milder form of those disabilities or don't but under special circumstances need them. What about people that are blind? What are some of the things that you can do for them? All right. Well, that's not something that a web developer can do. Uh, a blind person can get a, a Braille tablet to, to read the pages on there. But that, that's a good point. I guess um, at this point I'm not talking about the, the assistive technology. I'm talking about how to make your site more usable. I was going to say just keep it simple because it doesn't so much help. You know, it helps the program that assists the blind person. You know, right. Ah. I've turned it on a couple right. times. I can hear it. it's a headache to listen to. Right. Because it talks everything down the page. Uh, for one thing, for those of you that, that may have done web design, you know, in the past, years ago, one thing is keep your, keep your layout simple. Don't use tables for layouts. Tables are a nightmare when a screen reader tries to read them. All right, as you can imagine. That becomes very difficult. Um, so therefore, don't use tables for layout. Use CSS like we're doing in the divs and all that. So keep your page layout simple, and that will help the screen reader navigate it. Some of the other ones we talked about, all attributes. Some of the other things possibly include text along with an image. Yes. Shortcut keys, another excellent case. Those would benefit people that are visually impaired. Those would also benefit people that have certain motor uh, control uh, issues, carpal tunnel, I would think, especially. Um, so again, accommodations that would help that. I, yes? Can shortcut keys be put directly in the HTML, or do you need to use another one? No, you can use the HTML. There, uh, we're running short on time today. When we revisit this, uh, I'll show uh, the example to do that. I don't believe all browsers support them. You know, big surprise there. But uh, again, we, we can take a look at those. All right. The other thing I would say is, in addition to image, have text. All right. Now, isn't that interesting? Five minutes ago, we said for people with dyslexia, in addition to text, have images. Now we're saying, in addition to images, have text. Well, that actually is really one of the principles of universal usability. And we'll come back to this next time. But the idea of presenting the same content multiple different ways. All right? And that has so many benefits. Um, I talk about this a little bit in my multimedia class. That has accessibility benefits for one. It also has benefits for people that learn different ways. Now you might say, well, learn different ways. You know, I'm, I'm doing a, a website for a shoe store. I'm not trying to teach people something. Well, learn, remember, all means pretty much the same thing. You, know? you, you can reach people's heads different ways. All right? Some people by hearing, some people by seeing, and so on. So by having the same content presented multiple ways, that's a big benefit. But I have to stop myself now. All right? um, remember, Thursday we are going to have our visitors. And after they're done, I'm not sure how long they'll go. Um, we'll continue with this topic. All right, see you over in lab.